Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Stacey Agem. I'm a marketing manager here at Siegel Scientific. Today's presentation, Automation with Bartender, will be presented in English, regardless of the language you heard when logging on. And just to let you know, everyone will receive a link to the recording, everyone who's registered. So keep an eye out for that. There will be a live Q&A at the end of this webinar. So throughout the presentation, please go ahead and submit your questions. And today's lead presenter is Lee Stevens, Senior Sales Engineer. And we also have two other presenters on the line with us today, Roberto Posada, Sales Engineer, and Stephen Watkins II, Sales Engineer. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Lee. Okay, thank you, Stacy, and welcome everybody. Welcome, Roberto and Stephen, as they will be uh, assisting me, especially on the Q and A portion. Uh, and welcome to Automating Bartender. So let's take a fast look at this. Okay, so if you were on here yesterday, you might have seen uh, this email, this uh, label going, "Oh my gosh, what's going on over here?" All of a sudden, two folders got created. And when I go into those folders, I have some labels. Matter of fact, I have uh, multiple labels. They're not even uh, the ones that I'm connected to. How in the world did that happen? Well, what happened is I had a, this is a uh, tool called Insomnia, and it can pretend to be a data source for me. And that's what it's doing here, is it's pretending to be a data source. So it might be like your WMS or your ERP or your uh, MES or your LIMS. And it was sending information to a URL that's on my computer. And that URL happens to belong to this bartender integration. And notice it says waiting for events. And that's what I had running here. So what happened was is when I took, when I had insomnia send this information via a web service function called a post to bartender, bartender went through and it immediately started processing all of the work. And we can actually come in here and see the messages as Bartender was doing this. And that's what we're gonna learn about today. How to print Bartender labels without actually having to open Bartender and do any kind of keyboard work yourself. We call these integrations. We call putting integrations into place, automating your labeling process. So that's what we're going to be working on today. And we're going to pop back into the slide deck really quick here. And let me catch up to where I was. And let's talk about a few things that you're going to need to know for this presentation to really work with you. Um, and I don't know how I ended up with a duplicate down there, but it is worth absolutely saying twice. Label automation starts with data and a trigger. So automation, taking information from some kind of data source, generally a business system, and having bartender detect it because it is somehow appearing to bartender. And then bartender grabs it through its integration service, figures out the appropriate template or templates to use, the printers it's supposed to go to, and we can do even more fancy things with it as well. But bottom line, it then goes about generating the right label out of the right printer at the right time. So a little more detail, what do we mean by a trigger? So triggers are things that happen that bartender is able to detect. Now, this I've got two of them out here outlined because these are the two that we're going to be really taking a look at today, uh, file drop and web service. There are other ways of also having a trigger occur. You can have it from a database where all of a sudden a record appears or it changes. 
for very fast operations, uh, especially when it's doing high speed production uh, things, then it's network socket. We also can connect to a serial port. So a barcode scanner, a scale, a, uh, I beam, a, uh, a, uh, inf an I beam, I'm sorry, infrared I beam has been broken. Likewise, we can even do it according to a schedule. We can go very old school with uh, Microsoft Messaging Queue, and we can even be triggered by an email if you set us up right. So these are the triggers. These are the things that are saying to bartender, I need you to get printing. And that's the starting point. Now, generally, that trigger will also include the data, which is what happened here. The trigger was Insomnia sending a message to this URL that included this information. So the, this is the way it happens probably more often than not. The trigger includes the data, but it doesn't have to. It can actually just sometimes be a, an empty file, just a blank email with one piece of information, sometimes just the fact that it's a trigger itself and then that can launch bartender into action to go off and do other things such as uh, update a database, uh, go and grab some more input elsewhere, execute another uh, action. And we can combine all of these things together into an integration service. Now, the biggest thing of course that people do with integration, uh, bartender integrations is they print and they print through the print engine which is another name we have for uh, our, uh, down here, for uh, the designer. Now, let's talk about, before we look into the triggers, let's talk about how labels get printed because this is really important. You just don't start automating things. You have to think about your labels and the processes you have to figure out what's the best kind of, of a trigger? And to do that, you want to look at how am I producing these labels? Now, it's not that one company or one organization does only one kind, although that might be the case. Most of us actually have some types of printing that fall into all three of these categories. And these categories are when each action, each record, each label is its own unique thing. It, it's, there's something about it, whether it's the when it's entered, how soon it has to be printed, the uh, things it needs to be printed with, something about it that can't wait, has to be done now, and is very unique. We call those transaction-based labels because it's like an order entry comes in or somebody is generating an RMA uh, label, uh, something like that. It's very discreet, very individual. Those are, tra again, transaction-based orders or individual record transactions. Now, batch labels, most of us are pretty familiar with, and the name kind of implies what it is. We're dealing with everything in one big batch or one big data table. Batches are great when I am needing to produce a lot of very similar labels. Batch labels tend to be the same label from the same printer. They don't tend to be just in time. They're ones that you print out ahead of time because you're gonna be generally hand applying them or maybe you're scrolling them up uh, on a, uh, you, you, they're on a roll. And as they come out one roll, they get uh, printed and then immediately spun onto another roll for in, uh, being placed on some kind of automatic machinery down the road. But it's a batch job as far as bartender is concerned. And then there's another type called uh, direct monitoring. And this is where bartender is monitoring something, waiting for something to occur. Oftentimes this is in a database record table. So maybe it's monitoring an open orders table. And when it sees the order pop in, it grabs it 
and then goes off and generates all of the necessary documents, updates the record, and which moves it out of that uh, open record, uh, open order table, and uh, moves it somewhere else. And those are also very powerful. Um, here you see the pros and the cons. So individual, high flexibility, but overall the process is slower because every record has to be looked at and thought about individually. Think about it this way. Somebody gives you a whole stack of cards. If you start realizing that every card has completely different separate instruction, you're gonna have to read through each one of those cards. On the other hand, if I give you a deck of cards and I just say, shuffle and deal them out and you don't have to look at any of them they're all to be treated the same way that's fast that's real easy that's a batch process so you get to do everything you're handling every card the same way you don't care really what the content is and then the final one of the direct monitoring this is pretty good but it does require levels of database access that your security people might be a little hesitant about and it can make them nervous and it it also means you may have to if you're uh, working remotely now i gotta have a secure link up there and all of this whereas if i do it with a batch oh i can send that over the open internet pretty much and just say here here's the data go and print so pluses and minuses pros and cons and you want to take all of these things into account before you decide on your trigger because your trigger is going to play into the type of printing that you do. So the arrows here show the ones that we are going to be looking at today. Uh, and remember, there is no one right way. A lot of right ways in Bartender. Beautiful thing, one of the beautiful things, lots of beautiful things about Bartender. One of them is this we don't force you to change your system to suit us you can configure bartender to suit your business processes now we're going to show you some abilities here that allow you then to say hmm you know i've always wished i could do it a little bit differently because it would be a little bit more efficient we give my customers a little bit better service that we can definitely help you with because you can design a bartender integration to fit what you need and want. So database overrides, that is probably the single most common type of bartender integration that is out there. It's actually one of the easiest to construct. You simply have to understand the mechanism of what's going on. It's awesome for printing large jobs and we're gonna do one of those this morning. The other type we're going to do is individual record transactions. Now that's a transaction-based system. Think back to that order entry process that I talked about early on. Here's where I'm only getting one record or maybe a few records at a time. And I need each record to be looked at because each record can be treated at some point differently than all of the other records. It might be a different label, it might be pushed out to a different printer, it might trigger a different process, it might do all of those things. But that is what an individual record transaction is really good for. And then the final one, direct database monitoring, and that's where bartender will log into a database and monitor a table for you. This is really good when that data source does not have the ability to export data automatically. So think of things like Access or Excel. This is probably the most common thing that we see going on out there right now is people take Bartender and they tie it into Excel. So why do they do that? In large part because it's hard to automate Excel. And uh, But for other types of data sources, Automation is actually built into the whole process. And we're gonna talk about what you need to do with those other sources in order to get the integration going. So with that understanding, why don't we drop right back into here? And I'm going to pop back up. Now notice, this was an example of 
an individual record or transaction type process. Okay, so the trigger, which was a you uh, what I called a web service post, carried the data. How bartender treated the data was in a transaction based method, and we'll get into that and see exactly how that worked in just a moment. But the key point here was that it looked at the data that came in, which is all of this data here, names and addresses and cities, pay attention to the city, because bartender was told, oh, we want to sort the labels out by city, even though the labels are not in that in any particular order. So we start off here with St. Paul, and then we go to Minneapolis, and then we go back to St. Paul, and then Minneapolis again, and then St. Paul. But because Bartender was able to look at every record individually, it was able to uh, put into, create a folder and actually put into each folder the uh, labels that are, were appropriate for that city. Okay, let's go ahead and delete these because I, we don't need them right now. And let's take a look at what I need to do to, we're gonna do a, um, the first one we're gonna do is just gonna be a database override because I told you that that was the most common one. And you're gonna see how that works. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do these uh, not through web services, but through a file drop. And there are a couple of reasons why I'm gonna be using file drop. The first is it's been around for a long time. Uh, it's easy to set up and you don't have to be a web person in order to understand what's going on. So it really makes a great demo because you can see the process. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be setting Bartender up so that it monitors a folder I've called trigger folder. And when it sees a file that appears in here that matches a, cert, a, a certain scan it's looking for, it's gonna grab it, it's gonna process it, and then it's gonna put the output here in the PDF output file. Now, what kind of files do I wanna do? In principle, I could do this with an Excel file. But in practice, it's rarely done with an Excel file. And there are a lot of good reasons for this. First of all, Excel files are big. Compared to the data that they contain, Excel files are normally much, much bigger. The other thing is that normally I am creating this data file out of another data system. And a lot of data systems don't support creating Excel files, not at least easily, especially if I'm having to combine data from a lot of different internal data tables into a single data table that gets sent to bartender. So the two most common ways data is moved to bartender is uh, through a couple of data formats, one called CSV, which is what we have here. Now a CSV stands for simply comma separated value. And you can see that's exactly what we have. We have values in here, name, address, address two, test name, test address one, test address two, so on. And they're separated by a comma. Now, the comma in this case is also sometimes called a delimiter, and we won't go down that path, but there are a lot of variations to this. This is just the simplest form. But what's great about this is it's small. If uh, I'm gonna uh, pull over here a folder, that will show you a combination of, here we go. So a database for Minnesota in Excel file size, we'll stretch this out, is 11 kilobytes. But if I extract that data and put it just into a CSV, it's only one kilobyte. Now this is only on a limited number of orders, but I think you can see how that would stack up very, very quickly. Now, I know if you look closely, you're gonna see that 
uh, oh, that looks like an Excel uh, label format. Actually, it's not quite. This actually has the letter A, meaning it's in an ASCII format. Um, likewise, this one here has an ASCII format. Now, I'm going to show you uh, this is this uh, test file, but let's open up one of these and take a look at what it looks like with a lot of data. So I'm just using what's called an ASCII editor here. This one happens to be Notepad++. You could use your regular Notepad if you want. We're going to open up the Minnesota orders. Oop, that's Excel. See all of the stuff that's in here with Excel? All of that information needs to be moved. Let's see what happens if I come here and I open up uh, the CSV version of Minnesota orders. There's the data. So if I'm moving CSV, I'm just moving this. If I'm moving an Excel file, I'm moving all of this. Now I think you're starting to see why we tend to move things in CSV. Another common format that's a little more sophisticated is called XML. There's also JSON. We can support all of the standard ASCII or text file uh, types of data files. So, uh, but CSV is probably the king when it comes to this kind of transaction. So this is what the raw data looks like. Now, let's go back to the samples one. Notice that this first line here is the same as the first line here. In fact, if this were in Excel, these would be the column headings. And this is an important row because Bartender, we're gonna tell it that that row includes the names of the fields that would normally be there. So this first piece of information is gonna be the name field. This second piece of information, well, that's address. The third piece, if there is one there, is going to be called address two. If it's not there, notice what we do though. We have an empty space. We still have to maintain the number of commas. This is why it's oftentimes called a comma delimited file because we are showing the limits of the data by the commas and even if there is nothing to be there, we still have to have the commas there so the data structure is maintained, okay? Just like leaving an empty slot place on your bookshelf when you pull out a book. You wanna leave that empty slot there so that when you are ready to return, you can put the book right back into its place. So how do I go from this to this? Well, it's actually quite simple. And if you take a look, you'll notice that while I have CSV uh, versions of the Minnesota orders and the Hawaiian orders, I don't have a CSV version of the LA orders. So why don't we take a look at uh, the LA orders and let's make a CSV file. So I'm just gonna open up, bar uh, open up Excel and here's my CSV file. And notice again, it does look a lot the same structure as the CSV. It's just that I've got all of this Excel stuff around it. And that's what we're going to be trying to get rid of. Now, this is how easy it is to create an, a, a CSV file. But pay careful attention because Excel will try and take you down a wrong path at one point. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to come up here to your uh, file option. You're going to click on there and you're going to come down and you're going to stretch this out a little bit more. You're going to pick export. Now, it'll try and tell you, oh, you want to export Adobe PDF? No, we don't want to do that. We want to change the file type. And if you remember, I said this is a CSV file. Well, if we look down here under the different file types that are available, we find CSV. So we're going to click on that, and then we're going to click on Save As. Now here I can come in, and Bartender automatically puts a CSV uh, in front of it, which is great. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm also, and I'll explain in a moment uh, why I'm doing this, but we're going to also put in there 
a capital B and a dash. Bartender is going to be paying attention to that B or that T when we build our integrations, and you'll see why in a little bit. Okay, so we're going to take advantage of a cool ability Bartender has. So we're going to tell it we want to save, but here's where Microsoft will trip you up. You think, oh, I've already got this defined as CSV. Let me just click and save. Uh uh, don't do it because Microsoft saves it in the most limited form of CSV. Now, if all you're doing are address labels, that might be good enough. But a lot of the time, you're doing much more sophisticated things. You're doing things such as uh, chemical labels, doctor's prescriptions, uh, pharmaceuticals, medical device. You are doing things that involve special characters. If you've ever had to hold the alt key down and type in something on the number pad, you've used a special character. There are even ke keyboard characters that this, the limited form of CSV considers to be special and they will not come through. Instead, you'll get some kind of strange character that uh, Excel put in in its place. So what we have to do is tell it the right type of CSV to do, and this is the one you want. CSV UTF-8. That's the version of CSV that supports all of those special characters. So make a note of that. Can't emphasize it enough. This is one of the things you want to make sure on uh, when you are converting an Excel file. Um, there's actually another thing you want to make you want to make sure to do, by the way, and it's not as bad with zip codes, but if you deal with something called GTINs or you have long serial numbers, okay, you really, really, really want to do this in Excel or it, Excel, when you try and use it, will mess you up. The problem is with these numbers, for example, a G10 number, is that number is really just a numeric reference. It's not meant to be treated as a regular number, but Excel will do it that way, even if you don't tell it. See, if I click on data here, and I go uh, to my data, uh, easier this way. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna say, uh, format my cell. Uh, it says general, but bartender will treat it as a number. I'm sorry, not bartender, Excel will treat it as a number. And what Excel does when numbers get very big, it converts them into scientific notation. That's that. Instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it would show up instead as 1.2345 times uh, 10 to the something or another. And that's how Excel will export it. I've had a lot of customers that this has caused them no end of trouble because their data was low in Excel and they had it set to general, which meant Excel tries to figure it out and Excel will default to this every single time. And it just really caught it, or this, see, 1.23E plus uh, 0 0.8. That's what it would convert it to. So what you wanna do, if you are using any kind of numbers, I just do it for all of my uh, columns. You wanna come in here and you wanna say, you know what? Um, on my cell formatting, these are all text. And the only thing you should ever keep as a number in Excel is something that you are actually doing mathematical calculations on, add, subtract, multiply, divide, percentage, etc. The rest of it, always save it as text. So um, lecture on Excel over, but that is an important thing for you to keep in mind. Okay, so let's take a look. We just saved uh, that LA orders one. And let me, uh, let's see, what did I do with my notepad? Here we go. So now I'm just gonna open up 
the LA, uh, here we go, LA orders. And there we go. So you can see that it did convert it correctly. It kept the numbers because I had set these to text earlier correctly. So I now have good CSV. That's how uh, easy it is to convert out of CSV. Okay. Well, what do we do with it now that we have it? Well, we're going to actually take these orders and we are going to uh, drop them in. Let me see here. I think I just. Here we go into the trigger file and then let me get to my, that's the data. Uh, okay, I think I accidentally clicked out of my uh, appropriate file here. Let me get back to my PDF file so we can watch it as it generates it. Let's see, demo. And by the way, notice that I work from the root directory of uh, my computer, not from uh, the documents. And the reason is, is that the document setting in here uses, if I click on this, this will have my user ID included in it, which then Bartender has to include in any file reference. Well, that makes it kind of awkward when I save a file that has a link to a specific Excel file and I send it over to somebody else to look at because when they open it up, their user ID doesn't match. But if I save everything to the C drive and the other person does the same kind of structure, then uh, everything lines up and it'll all work. So little tip there, Stephen talked about it yesterday. I'm gonna, uh, and I'm reinforcing it here. So. We've got our PDF output folder here, and this is where we're going to see the results coming in. Now, what we're going to be doing in a database override, which is a batch thing, is we're going to take an ex a uh, file that we have here. Uh, this is pretty much what Stephen built yesterday. And we are going to replace the database that it's currently connected to, which happens to be uh, the LA one, See, here are all of the different uh, addresses. We're going to replace it with a different one. And we're going to have it automatically print all of the labels from that. And that's because we're going to override the existing database with a new one. But for this to work, we need to do one more thing. If we come in here and we take a look at what Stephen had done, is he had tied this to an Excel spreadsheet. So we're going to have to change that from an Excel spreadsheet reference to a CSV reference. And it's actually pretty easy. What I'm going to do is just come in here and I'm going to use this X for delete. And I'm going to delete the connection. I'm going to say OK. And then I'm going to go ahead and save the file. So I now have a file that a uh, template that has no database connected to it. So now I'll start one. And instead of Excel, I'm going to go here, text file. Notice includes CSV and fixed widths, which is exactly what I want. So I'm going to go next, and then I'm going to go to file name. Now I did a little bit of work ahead of time. I could have gone ahead and used one of the CSV files that have all of the data in it. But you don't need to have that file ahead of time. You just need to know what the structure of the file is. And so I actually have an example here. Notice the A, so this is CSV, as well as back here, it's an ASCII file. I have one that has just fake data in it, but it follows the same structure. And that's really convenient for me. It means that I don't have to have the data. I can just pass this around if somebody needs to train Bartender on what a database is supposed to look like. And we're actually going to use this same file a little bit later when we build our integration. So right now, we're just setting this up so that this template is connected. Notice it. Rec bartender recognizes, oh, this is the good CSV file. It's a UTF-8, so that's great. 
and we're going to move on through. By the way, one comment on CSV, don't put spaces in the file names, in the field, in the, uh, sorry, in the, uh, what's called the header row. You want, uh, when you do this, you want to have no spaces because uh, it doesn't, uh, having space in a header name violates CSV. So we're going to click finish and we're going to say, okay. And there we are. Now there's only one record here, but we now show as test name, test address, test city, et cetera. We're going to save that as a different file name. And notice I already have a database override here. I'm just going to write over the top of it uh, with this same one. And yes, I know you exist, but I'm going to save over it anyway. And the reason I'm doing that is because I already have an integration built to look at this and it's going to make it easier for you to see. So I now have my template ready and it didn't actually take me that long at all. Matter of fact, it took me more time to save the Excel file as a CSV than it did to make uh, convert this into something that can receive an integration. Well, now let's get busy on the integration. And how do I get to it? Well, it's really quite simple. Now, I could come down here and click on Start and then find Bartender 2022 and then go down and click Integration Builder there. Uh, or because I work with it all the time, you might notice I have it here on my taskbar. But you know, there's also an easier way. See where it says tools here? If I click here, Bartender shows me all of the different supporting applications that come with my Bartender. Now, by the way, what I'm working with here is Bartender Automation and Enterprise Editions only from this point on. Up till now, I could do everything with Designer. Here is when I need to have Automation Edition or Enterprise Edition. I'm gonna click on Integration Builder. And of course, it popped it on the other screen, but let me pull this over. Ah, my other screen is a little bit smaller than this. And so let's see here. Let me do this. I did not anticipate this problem. Okay, well, we're gonna walk through this oversized as it is. All right, it's actually pretty simple. On the, over here, you can see different integrations that we've worked, that I've been working with, but we're gonna focus on create a new integration. And with the create new integration, when I clicked on it, it pops up another full file. And this one's behaving a little better. So, it gives me a choice of the different integrations that I can use. And I'm gonna pick, in this case, a file one because we're gonna do these as file drops. Web service would also be available, database, and you see all of the other options as well. So we're gonna click on file. And now let me move this over to here. This is really more about Windows, I think, than anything else. Here we go. So this is my basic integration, and this is what you'll start off with. So the first thing I'm gonna do is come up to this file integration here, and I'm gonna give it a name. And I'm gonna call this um, my uh, FD, or I'm gonna give it Sherlock FD, which for me means file drop. And I'm gonna say, and this is my, database override one. Now, I could call this anything I want. It's not, it's gonna be important in some respects, but it's mainly for my own information. Now, I can enter information here describing what's going on, et cetera, or I can simply leave it blank. We're gonna leave it blank for right now. Now I get to the file detection, and this is where the integration starts to get fun. So we can look here and see that this is actually divided into about five sections. What's the source of my data? How do I detect it? What do I do if I detect more than one? 
what I what do I do after I detect the file and what do I do if for some reason this integration fails so we're going to address each one of these sections now the default here is relative to the integration and that is kind of useful if I'm doing things in cloud and I'm doing stuff on kind of sophisticated but it is it, it is very usable and useful in a lot of cases but for demonstration purposes it's a lot easier to do this we're going to say you know what bartender i want you to look at a particular location on a computer or network and when i pop up the browse notice it will give me access to uh, other drives as well as well as um some uh, shared drives here. In our case, we are going to look at what do you remember what it was? The trigger folder. Because this is where I want Bartender to be watching for one of those data files that we created to all of a sudden appear. Now, I've got some other things I can set here if I need to do some sophisticated stuff or just going to let this go. Um, this is how it's looking and how often it looks. I, you know, you can do it in hours or milliseconds, whatever you need. Um, but then we get to the file pattern. Now, Bartender defaults looking for a data file with the extension of .dat. If you remember, we gave those CSV files the extension CSV. So we're going to enter that here. Okay. Now, coming on down, I could do a lot of other things. Hey, after the detection, uh, what are some other weight things to look for? I've got this defaulted to uh, when the file is created. I could have it when a file is changed. And I could do some other settings here. So again, you can really refine down what it is you're looking for. And I could also add in uh, if I expected to have multiple files that all fit this detection uh, uh, for, uh, requirement. If I have all, of, if I have a bunch of them, how do I want that sorted? Uh, do I want to do it uh, creation, ascending, descending, etc.? Um, so in this case, I'm just going to click X because uh, we're not going to have that. Now, action after detection. Here, what Bartender can, will do, it, it can actually do a number of things. The most common thing is that we have it rename the file. We could also have it delete the file or move it, depending on what your requirements are. But what we're going to say is rename the file. And instead of TXT, I'm going to have it rename it as done. That way I know that Bartender has picked that file up and has worked on it and it's finished and almost other files might have a TXT, but almost nobody else uses done. Same reason, if for some reason it fails, I'm going to keep it as the extension of failed. So I've now defined, let's take a look, where I'm looking, what I'm looking for, any file be, uh, that has a CSV in it. Now, remember I had it uh, doing something special there for a moment? We'll come, uh, hopefully we'll have time and we'll come back to it. But this is where I would use that either B, capital B or capital T to indicate uh, to bartender, is this an appropriate file for it to look at? Matter of fact, I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Since this, we're building this as a database override, that is what kind of function? It's a batch printing process. And that's what the B stands for. I'm going to do a B dash asterisk CSV. So this integration will only pick up CSV files that have a capital B and a dash at the very beginning. If the file instead has a T, which we will use for transaction, it will ignore that file. This allows multiple bartender integrations to be monitoring the same folder. This kind of flexibility is built all throughout bartender and allows you to really give it some unique capabilities. So we've defined the file, the input data. This is the easy one. Here you don't, for, for this kind of integration, you don't have to enter anything. 
I could enter in one of these, but the best thing to do is just leave it unstructured, let bartender figure it out. Variables, we also don't touch a lot, but I want you to notice one variable in particular though, event data. So when bartender detects that file, it opens it up and it sucks the whole thing in, but it doesn't know yet that it's a data table. All it knows is that it is one massive blob of data. And so it takes that massive blob of data and it assigns it a name, and this is the name it assigns it, event data. Kind of self-describing. This is the data that came in with my event. And it's that event data variable that we are going to be using in the rest of the actions. So we come here to actions. Now, if I were doing this as an individual transaction, I would have more stuff in here. But in this case, I pulled it in as just this blob. All I want to do is have it in the integration, pass that blob down to the template and use it in place of the database. And in Bartender, we make that really easy. So I'm gonna print on this action, or click on this action, print document. Matter of fact, I'll delete it. It comes there by default, but I do wanna show you all of the actions that are available. Actions in Bartender are commands that you can use to have Bartender perform different functions, different actions, and there's a lot of them. In fact, there's well over 60 different ones. And if you do any kind of scripting or coding, or even say some extensive Excel uh, spreadsheet work, you'll recognize these types of actions and functions. And you'll start to realize, oh wow, I can actually do an awful lot inside of Bartender. And it is true, you are able to do an awful lot. We also group them for you. So in this case, we just need to do a print and I'm just gonna select there and click OK. And there the print action has appeared. Now in integrations, we work from the top, down to the left, and then in. So whatever action we are on here, you may have been noticing affects this panel to the right. So now that I'm on print document, these options refer specifically to this action. For this integration, it's pretty straightforward. When I have a lot of different actions, that's something you want to keep an, an eye on. So, document. This is the first and most important thing. What document am I going to print? And where do I, uh, where does Bartender find it? So again, we have this by default relative to integration, but we're going to pick computer network. And then we're simply going to use the browser and we're going to go to where I've got those uh, templates, which is in my integrations demo and here. And remember, we saved this as DB override integration. And you can see the timestamp here. So we're gonna pull that in. And notice it's actually gonna generate a preview image here. So you, act, you can kind of double check, and yep, that's the one we wanted and it's showing the right data. Now, the next thing I do is really important here. I'm going to import the document settings. When I do that, Bartender is going to, Bartender integration is going to go into the template and it's going to pull up all of the references for it. So, Bartender integration now understands that this template is connected to a database. That's an important action because we're going to be looking, telling Bartender to replace that database. Anytime you make a change to your template, you'll need to come back and tell Bartender to import the document settings again so it knows what those changes were. Now we'll come to the print options. And here we uh, can tell it where to go and do the print. We can pick from any one of our printers. We're going to do PDF so you guys can see it. Um, I'm also able to give it other uh, in pieces of information. I could give it, 
its own specific job name, um, et cetera. One of the things I can do is tell it where to print. So we're gonna come in here to the advanced printer options. And we're going, for the most part, we can just leave these as is. I am going to change where it's going. And we will come to here and then, oh, not there. I wanna go down to my PDF output folder there. And now I could also go ahead and put in another option here. Remember the variables? Well, one of the variables that we have is what is the file name that came in and a file name without extension. So I'm gonna add that variable in and then I'm gonna get rid of the integration name. In bartender integration, anything between percentage signs is a variable. So it will now create a PDF with the name of the file, that Excel file that we're dropping, or I'm sorry, CSV file we're dropping, and that's what it's gonna create. If there's more than one already there, it will make it unique by adding a number to the end of it, which is great. Okay, now I come down to the part that where we're actually gonna tell Bartender to substitute that blob. I told it, do a database override. So Bartender, remember when we did the import uh, document settings? That's how Bartender knows that the uh, data table that the template is connected to is called sample order CSV. And so it knows what that structure looks like. And so I'm gonna tell it, yes, that is, and there could be more than one, but I'm gonna tell it that is the one I wanna override. The source is a variable because remember, that's where that blob is stored and that blob is stored as event data. And we're basically done because what Bartender now knows is that it's to take that data file and drop it in and print it out. Do you wanna see this work? I do. So first, let me uh, do a quick save. Always uh, a good idea, save your work. So um, I'm gonna go back to my integrations here. Uh, I'll put it in my demo folder. Webinars, integrations, here's the integration. Notice I've got WS for um, a web service integration. Uh, this is just how I like doing things. I'm gonna call this Sherlock address parenthetically uh, FD for file drop, and it's a DB override. And that's so I know what kind of integration this is. And my extension is BTIN for bartender integration file. And I will now save that. And I'm gonna shrink this file down a touch so we can see uh, things as they work. Uh, okay, we're gonna move it over to here. Now comes the next part of the integration, test. This is a very, very powerful tool. Now, what's also powerful is you can have it simulate the print. This saves you on a lot of uh, printing paper um, that you can use. But because we're going to PDF, I'm not going to uh, use that in this case, but I'm simply gonna tell it to start. And notice it's now waiting for events and it's looking for that database override uh, integration and it's started with that. So now all I have to do is pop in the LA orders one. And I'm gonna move that. Notice that I got B for batch and it's a CSV. And I'm gonna tell it to copy. And it should have gone, oh, I know why. I put that in PDF output, ha. I need to put that in the trigger folder. Watch what happens here. So we're gonna come here, we're gonna go, copy, boom, done. That's how fast it worked. And, oh, you know what? It popped up a data entry form, that's, because there's one more setting in that file I need to do. So we're gonna come back down here to my integration override and we're gonna to go to file, we're gonna to go to print. Remember we had 
we have a data entry form here. So I could do this one at a time if I wanted to, you know, hand enter it. If I'm doing bash files, I don't want to. I could just delete it, or I can come here and I can say under the print command, enable data entry, I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna close it and save it. And then I'm gonna to go to my integration, which is here. I'm gonna stop this, I'm gonna come back, and on my print document, under my print options, there's another setting right here. Prompt for data input, I'm gonna take that off. And then I'll save the file, we'll do the test, and let me move. Notice we have or the LA orders done. I'm just gonna move this over to here again. We'll do a copy, okay, and I'll start. And boom, it took care of it. Notice it gave it a one, so it is unique. Here's the PDF, and here are all of the Hollywood uh, orders that got generated. So I know that I'm running late, and I didn't get to do my web service one, which is a shame because it's really cool. Uh, we may have to try and do another one later with the web service, but. For right now, uh, let's pop back really fast uh, to the uh, presentation. And Roberto and Steven, uh, do we have lots of questions coming in? Hey, Lee, and awesome job with the presentation. That was spot yeah. on. Um, we do have a number of questions that have come in. It's probably going to be just you and myself. Roberto had to drop off. So, okay. We'll look and see what we got here for you. I'm still right. here, guys. So, so okay. need help. I'm still here. Good job, by the way, Lee. Okay. Uh, there's uh, Just... there was a question. Uh, the first one I want to tackle with is um, multiple documents within Integration Builder. Could you yes. go to Integration Builder and show them that you are able to run this parallel and have multiple documents print from one trigger? Oh, just show them yes. the actions, please. Yeah, I absolutely will. So let me. Um... I actually have one, I'm gonna stop that integration and I'm gonna uh, tell it to open one. Now, this is one I, I built a few years ago using Bartender actually 2019 at the time and it still uh, can, can run. This is a very advanced one where it's for a fulfillment warehouse that's supporting three different retailers and it needed to print a uh, shipping label a branded ad address label and a coupon that would get inserted into the box inviting the person to go to this website and do and the coupon was specific to that customer based on their uh, usage history and so that was a file drop where uh, we actually were looking at each record individually and we would convert it to a database and then from that csv file we knew we could go and take a look at the um, different integrations. I don't know why this isn't. Oh, I'm, it's because I'm on the wrong thing. Here we go. Um, so database connection for each record. But the key here is um, it then takes one of the uh, record, one of the fields, and it knows that it's supposed to be a URL. And so it actually does a web service call to go and get information from that website. And then it would break that information down into the SKU, the price, the title, and another URL for the image, a picture of that file. And then from there, it would print one document um, and it would uh, vary the document according to the shipping uh, order. Notice I've got another uh, variable here. So this could be, oh, this needs to go USPS, this needs to go UPS, this needs to go FedEx, and so on. And then a branded return address label, and that would take advantage of the bartender template ability to change its appearance according to uh, specific information, in this case, what the retail brand was. And then the actual print coupon, which also would go and grab uh, use all of this data and grab the image that was saved. And 
all of it in one fairly short integration uh, and printing to three different printers all simultaneously. That's probably the, the most sophisticated example that I have ready to show, but we can get even more sophisticated than that. More questions? Okay. Does bartender, does bartender handle encapsulation text properly from a CSV file? Data is encapsulates using double quotes by default when the data content contains a comma. Yes. And that is one of the advanced options I referenced in, uh, in uh, when I was talking about CSV files. Uh, double, putting in quotes, double quotes, et cetera, are all pretty common usage and have been around for a long time. And Bartender supports all of that. And you can actually uh, do some of your own uh, stuff in there. So um, this doesn't have a database in there. But if I come in and I say, hey, it's a database file and um, uh, we'll capture here. Um, notice it says, oh, com this is a comma separated value. Here are some of the other options I have. Tab separated, delimited, fixed width, name value, XML. It will support uh, the percentage sign and you're able to do some more uh, things with it as well. So, uh, we are just incredibly flexible on that part of it. I just don't happen to have a one that uses uh, quotation marks to show you. All right. Thank you, Lee. Um, another one. Actually, I can ask this one. Um, they were saying they see we're short on time. Will you be posting questions and answers for it from attendees for all to see? Yes, we will be doing. We will be posting those uh, for the ones we aren't able to answer in the session today. Um, Lee, for you. Here's a fun yes. one. Can you print from a generated work order out of ERP system and point to the label part number and to be printed based on the quantity? Yes, because the quantity would be included in the order instruction. So uh, an order can include a lot of things. The example um, uh, here that this data file that it was being um, converted if we went in uh, this I don't have this do I still have this one set up um, if we took a look at it it had multiple pieces of information in there that were in addition to the order so one of those would be how many copies so bartender would know how many copies to produce now once it knows how many copies to produce it could change what printer it goes to it could change what functions it goes to because that is a piece of information that would be residing as a variable, probably called copies. And then you simply do checks based off of that. So I might come in here um, and say right here, I might add a new function in and I might say, you know what, I want my output to include an email. And so here I, I would set up all of the email stuff, but then I would come to action. And this is the very powerful part here. I can say when to do this action. Well, only do it based on a variable. And in this case, I could say that a variable here, it's a response. We'll pretend that that's actually copies. And I could say only when it is uh, greater than or equal to um, some number, uh, let's say 1000 you know, 10,000, maybe if it's a thousand, it needs to be routed as a PDF to a uh, digital press, such as an HP Indigo. So that is one of the things that you could set up to do. And only the ones that are that big would get routed that way. So. Well, thank Next you one. so much, Lee. Um, this is actually gonna, that was our last question we could answer live. However, yeah. We will be following up with individuals via email um, if you didn't have your question answered today. And I just want to say thank you so much uh, for everyone for joining us. It was a great session. We're so happy we could have you all. And please join us tomorrow for our session on mobile printing with Bartender hosted by Roberto. So yes, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And uh, by the way, these are helpful links uh, to walk you through
the stuff I didn't get to. So by all means, uh, look for that URL, look for the uh, attached file. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone.